Um, so next, I want to invite a community member up, um, Brian Felson, who's going to tell us a little bit about how he is doing his best. On a cold night in Philadelphia 21 years ago, in October, I was working late one night in the office. And when I finished work, I took the elevator downstairs and began the half mile walk home down Chestnut Street. It was very dark, the streets were desolate, it was foggy. And at some point about halfway home, I felt a strong blow to my back that took the wind out of me and I felt a hotness on the back of my neck. All of a sudden in front of me, there was a guy jumping around triumphantly saying, I got you, I got you, give it up, give me your money. So I gave him my wallet, had $12 in it. He looked a little disappointed, but he threw the credit cards on the street and stumbled off down the street, probably to buy some crack. I'm lying in the street, in the middle of the street, and there's a paramedic bent over me cutting my clothes off, and even though I can't really breathe, I'm kind of whispering the words and croaking them. I'm saying, why are you cutting my shirt off? This is, I like this shirt, <laughs> what's the matter with you? I can take my own shirt off, thank you very much. <laughs> and he said, just calm down, you're going into shock. I'm lying on a hospital operating table, connected to a breathing machine, looking at the beautiful fluorescent lighting that they have in hospitals. <laughs> And it starts to grow dimmer and dimmer and dimmer until all is black except that there's pinpricks of light. And I felt like a 10-year-old looking out at the galaxy. Except I felt really at peace. It wasn't like Monty Python's wonderful galaxy song, which I absolutely love. Um, it wasn't a, a gallows humor type of thing, like, okay, well, we don't believe in this, but it's all meaningless, so when, let's, let's laugh at the whole absurdity of the thing. Um, I felt an odd sense of comfort. Uh, it wasn't at the, the vastness of space and my insignificance in that. It was the expanse of time gave me an odd comfort because I started to reflect as I'm lying on the table that the universe is 13.8 billion years old or, or something like that and, and the solar system about four and a half billion and maybe we've got another about that amount left. And yet, during all that time, I'm not afraid of any of it. I'm not afraid of the year 1788 when Mozart was writing his last three symphonies, so why should I be afraid of the year 2188 after Brian Felsen has left the scene <laughs> when the next great composer writes his or her great symphonies? And then in front of me, I, I saw this vision. It was, it was, it was, I saw my savior. This, it sounds crazy, but it was a beatific image. It was, it was all in white radiant, glowing, charismatic, about 30-something. And uh, as he came closer, I read the name tag. It said, Dr. Michelson. <laughs> and the, the doctor said, your lung's been punctured, but you're going to be OK. And Again, oddly, instead of feeling relief at this, I felt an outpouring of love and gratitude because we were both here together connected the same night, except he was here by choice. He was here in the middle of the night, sacrificing his sleep in order, in the words of the song Amazing Grace, to save a wretch like me. He had sacrificed so many years learning organic chemistry, learning anatomy, learning pathology, and taking these damned exams to become certified to be able to, to save me. And I not only was thankful for that, but I was thankful for all the best and brightest in the history of our species that gave rise to the scientific method that brought us the tools and technology that saved my life. It took months for my wounds to heal. And ever since then, I've been inspired to write symphonies of my own and to help other artists musicians, composers, filmmakers, writers distribute their works and get their voices out. And now 21 years later, I go to Sunday Assembly and I talk to people about atheism, about spirituality, about the divine. And some people have a very strong intellectual conviction that there's no 
sense in believing in a God, that, that a, a being that created everybody and somebody that you should worship. And I also hear a lot of anger toward organized religion and the excesses of it. But for me, oddly, my atheism is, is a deeply held emotional and even spiritual feeling. I remember back to when I was in college before I got stabbed, and I would talk with my friends, and some of them would say, yeah, well, when you're on your deathbed, you'll see. You'll, you'll, you'll want that comfort. You're going to want that feeling of salvation and reassurance, and you'll convert. And I didn't. I held my ground, but I didn't hold my ground out of intellectual stubbornness. I held my ground because it gave me comfort to ha feel that there didn't have to be an asymmetry in how I regarded uh, existence before my birth versus how I view time after I leave the scene. And it gives me comfort and joy to feel gratitude not to some Bronze Age mythology or some metaphorical being who embodies the goodness of us all, but in the actual goodness of all that we can do and that humans have done. A, a few years ago, I talked to my friend, the philosopher Daniel Dennett, after he had his heart surgery, and, he, and I asked him how he felt after he went through it. And he said, I don't thank a god, I thank goodness. May we strive to do our best and live our highest selves and find the goodness within us all.